Hello and welcome to All of the Above. I'm James Brown. Thanks for joining me. You can check out my work at jamesbrowntv.substack.com and just about anywhere online at James Brown TV. Help me grow the program by liking, sharing, and subscribing. One of the things I love to do on this show is talk to people who do unique things for a living, like Lauren Carroll. Lauren Carroll, welcome to the program. Hello, thank you for having me. I took several shots at describing what you do, (laughs) and I failed. So how would you describe what you do? Um, so what do I do? That's always a good question. I like to think of myself as a um, holistic funeral arranger. And the reason I say that is because I am not the typical funeral director where you come in and you pick a package and you pay the big bill, you do the funeral and you walk away. Um, I think that there is so much importance in funerals and rituals And so I really make sure that any family that I work with, I hear them and I cater to their needs um, and make something unique, just like the person who's died. And then through that, I do education because what I learned as a funeral director over and over and over again is people would come in and have no idea what their loved one wanted, had no idea what kind of funeral they wanted because they never talked about it. And so me and my business partner, Erin, started a company called Death Wives. And that's really what we do. We focus on educating the general public about death and end of life, um, all the funeral options that people have, which are a lot more than what what most people think. Um, And then we help train death doulas, which are end of life It's an end of life, non-medical kind of companionship for people at the end of life. A little bit like hospice, but very unique and different as it really, like the work that I do for funerals, it really caters to each person's individual needs as they're they're nearing the end of their life. Okay, I want to parse that, but before I do... Uh, In the background, there's the thunder that Lauren mentioned before I started recording. I could definitely hear it in the background now. I believe it's thunder. It sure is. Yep. I'm in Colorado Springs and it is storming up. (laughs) So if you do hear it in the background, no worries. I I think Lauren is okay. Just a little bit loud a bit. (laughs) It's shaking my whole house that was built in the 1920s. So. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Yes. Uh, as is uh, as is my house. It's in the it's it's a nineteen twenties house as well. Oh, cool! So I want to parse some of the things we you mentioned in your description mm-hmm. uh, with a couple questions. Uh, how long did you work in a traditional funeral home environment? Yeah. So when I first started, I worked for a corporate funeral home, which the corporate funeral industry does own about one in four of the funeral homes in America. So when I say I worked at a corporate funeral home, that means I worked at probably the mom and pop funeral home that most people think has been, you know, run by the same family forever. Um, But it was really in that corporate setting that I realized how much was missing in modern day funerals here in America. Um, one of the things that I, I tell my students and families now is that I really think that funerals and death have become more of an industry um, than that personal community work that it used to be. And the reason I think that is because the funeral home and the corporation I worked for had these prepackaged funerals. You know, you get this casket, this these folders for the funeral, you get all these other things that help. Um, So it's an all-inclusive package, not very exciting in any way, but I got a commission on each one of those packages that that I sold. So I was making money off of people as they came into my funeral home at their most vulnerable time looking at me to tell them what to do. And what I realized 
again and again and again is it's not a business. People just need to be heard. People just need to know their options. And then when they do know their options, they have a much more, I don't even want to say uh, it's not really an enjoyable experience, right? There's still a lot of grief there. But the way that they grieve is so much different than when it's a prepackaged funeral, right? Because who are they grieving if it's an out of the box funeral versus the funeral that they go to where everyone's wearing Hawaiian shirts and playing their favorite songs and really celebrating the life of somebody that they love dearly. Okay. So that would be the alternative. The, the, after you know what kind of options you have, you would, you, you'd vary the ceremony, vary the environment, you know, break out the yeah. Hawaiian shirts or I'm assuming whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know, someone who, who you loved, who died, liked, I would presume. Exactly. And the hardest part about this job is that a lot of people don't talk about any of this or ask their person what they would like until the person's gone. And then they're kind of in this grief mode where they're sad. And then we're asking them to make all these major decisions of like, well, what kind of funeral would they want? What kind of things? And so a lot of it is empowering people now to plan their own funerals and so that they can kind of give that roadmap to their family so what when they are dead which i hate to tell you 10 out of 10 chance we'll all die someday <laughs> um but at least it's all there and i always like to say a really good funeral brings the person who died back to life just for that time you know you can feel their spirit and their energy when I'm selling these cookie cutter funerals, I wasn't feeling that energy and that same kind of vibe <laughs> that I do now when I help families. And that's what I meant when their grief is different because they're they're celebrating somebody in a unique way versus kind of just showing up and going through the motions of what they think a funeral is, which is kind of what we've been doing for the past, I don't know almost hundred years and it hasn't really worked out very well for us. I don't think here in America. How hasn't it worked out well? What do you, what do you mean by that? <sighs> well, I think what I mean is that comparably to other countries, we just haven't embraced death or tradition or cultural practices um, as much as we could. And the, the reason that's so important is death is a rite of passage it is something that should be honored and celebrated and we don't do that. And so I think a lot of people hold on to that grief, internalize that grief. And when grief doesn't have a space to move, like in other countries, you know, they'll dance and wail at funerals and really move that grief through their body. In America, we don't do that. And so I think that it has a negative effect on us, whether that is that it turns into depression, that it turns into illness, that it turns into addiction. Um, so I think that we've been doing ourselves a huge disservice with the way that we grieve and have funerals here. I tend to agree that even the most lively funeral services I've been to, you know, where people are wailing and, you know, crying and, you know, a bit loud are, they're not, you know, no one's up and dancing. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, right. it's, um, it's loud. It's, it, uh, you know, there, there's, it, it can be lively, you know, and, uh, you know, just, uh, from my experience, black funerals are a little bit different than white funerals. Oh, so much broadly. better. And, and I hate to say that in like, uh, it's true though. I have been to many different funerals and, and black people know how to celebrate death and grieve loudly and really, I think that's an exception to the rule here in America is that there are, it's a celebration, it's a going home. And I think that that is where we lack any sort of, um, there's no ritual there. We've kind of, us wh white Americans, I don't even like to put it that way, but they didn't hold on to those rituals. You know, we there's all sorts of different backgrounds. And so it turned into this really plain Jane, like, this is your funeral because you didn't bring in these traditions from Ireland. You didn't bring in your traditions from Norway, um, which is one of the things that I educate people on is really go back in your history 
and see how your ancestors grieved, see how they had funerals and bring that forward because it worked then and it works now. It's not how we grieve isn't broken. It is broken currently, but it wasn't broken for many, many, many generations. And I think black funerals show that that this has worked the way that they grieve for many, many generations. I do think, though, that that kind of business and industrial aspect of the American funeral industry has affected that, though. It doesn't get to go on for days. They don't get to be in the have a viewing for 24 hours because you have to pay the funeral home a large amount of money to rent for 24 hours versus it, they used to be in families' homes. You know, they used to be in the community. They'd have huge celebrations there, um, giving people more time and more opportunity to grieve versus now it's very scheduled. Here's two hours. Maybe here's a reception and move along. How uh, so many different questions come to mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. We have we have time, right? Yes. So how long ago did funerals go on for days? I mean, what what are you referring to there? Like, mm -hmm. was there a point in American history where we oh had goodness, longer yes. funerals? Yeah, definitely. Um, even I want to say until like the 1920s, 1940s, most funerals were held in the home. I think people don't understand that a funeral home wasn't always the norm. It was created to mimic the family home where funerals had always taken places. Um, and so, yeah, we used to have these home funerals for multiple days. Typically the first day, somebody would just be sitting with the body 24 seven, people would come and go to pay their respects. And then the next few days were celebrations and parties. And the last day was a day of mourning before the burial took place. Um, and oddly enough, this is still happening in America. These home funerals for multiple days have always still been legal, are still just as safe as they were before. Um, but most families don't know, right? They don't know that that's an option for them. They just assume that you have to use a funeral home. And so that's another thing I like to do is really educate people. Like these are, these are the rules. You've always had this right to make this choice to keep your person at home, just like we used to do. Um, you just have to use a few, few extra tools, which is ice instead of doing refrigeration or embalming. Um, but yeah, those those traditional ways are still available everywhere. Are there parts of the country where uh, home funerals are more common, or are there are there uh, cultures or or, uh, or or subcultures in in America in particular where they are common? Yeah, I was going to say in America it's really hard. I would say I have worked for all different families from all different walks of life from all different cultures. So it's hard to say. Um, I think the biggest part about it is that people need to be educated beforehand and know that they can do it because you do need to prepare. And since it isn't quote unquote, the norm that people are used to, um, you know, it takes some education too for the family and to show them how to do it. Um, and so with that, no, I haven't really noticed a particular place or people who really go to home funerals. It's people who learn about them and go, that's what I want. That's what I want for my family and come to us. So there's no real commonality or overlap between those types of families who make those decisions? Not... <laughs> Not that I know, really. I, I served on the board of directors for the National Home Funeral Alliance, which is a nonprofit that educates on home funerals. So, yes, it's a thing. And it's been a thing for quite a long time. Um, and during that time, I mean, we educate everywhere, anybody. Um, you know, death is is one of the most human things, as is birth. We're all going to go through it. So I don't I haven't really noticed anybody in particular who chooses home funerals versus somebody else 
it's just knowing that that's an option and saying yes to it. And thinking broadly, and and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is that you're one of the people now, I, I'd say of the all the people I've interviewed, and I've interviewed a, quite a few, you've experienced more funerals than just about anyone I've encountered. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, one of the classes I teach is how to plan your own funeral. And we started off with asking, have you ever been to a bad funeral? And almost every single person raises their hand, whether the person's identity wasn't properly ident- you know, um, their pronouns weren't used or, <laughs> or the pastor said their name wrong over and over again, or it became this fire and brimstone type service and they have no idea whose funeral they are at. So that's like the most common bad funerals. And it wasn't until recently that I realized, oh, I've been to hundreds of bad funerals. (laughs) I always just thought about my own family and and those experiences. But um, yeah, I've been to a lot of really, really bad funerals and I've been to some really beautiful, amazing, moving funerals. And so I think, you know, I have a VIP access to what most people do and how to do it really, really well and how not to do it. You've outlined a couple elements that come with bad funerals. What elements come with good funerals? I think... A good funeral is a place, again, it's, it sets the stage for love and grief. And the best way to do that is bring the person who died to that stage, right? We need to know who who we're grieving. So having lots of photos, having things that are them. Um, I did a funeral once for a beekeeper. And so we had um, flowers or flower seeds that we gave away to everybody at the end of the service and said, go plant these for the bees. Right. So it was a thing that was unique and special to him, but it also was something that could continue in these people's lives. Right. They get to grow flowers in his memory. And when they see the bees, they can remember him. Um, So little details like that can make such a difference because we really do need time to grieve. And if it's just a two hour mass where they, maybe read a little mini obituary, it doesn't really do the same thing versus planting flowers that you know this person would love and the joy that it gives you to see them, you know, blossom later in the year. Back at your corporate funeral days, mm-hmm. on an average week, how many funerals did you uh, see oh. or, or encounter? <sighs> It kind of just depends. I mean, sometimes it was three or four, which would be a lot in a week. Um, sometimes it would just be one. And I I went to a family-run funeral um, home, gosh, I'm trying to remember how many years ago. Um, but I was there during COVID. And that was really, really hard. That was the first time that I was like, I wish I could do funerals. I wish I could do funerals so much right now. Um because I had done funerals for so long and I knew how important they were, even if it was a bad funeral, I still knew that they were an important thing for people to have. It's kind of like that last page in the person's life book, right? Is that funeral. Um, And so when I had to tell families over and over and over again that they couldn't even have a funeral, I mean, I still think about all of them today is what have they done? What have they been able to do with that grief? And I really, really, really want people to know that it's never too late to have a funeral. It's never too late to celebrate somebody's life, especially people who didn't get that opportunity to. Um, So, yeah, that's I missed I missed seeing funerals, even if they weren't the best funerals. I feel like any funeral is better than nothing. And, you know, for three years, it was pretty much a lot of nothing. And it was really hard. Three years that you were referring to COVID, correct? Yes. How did you see the industry change? I know it, it, depending on the state and, and sometimes the locality, uh, mm-hmm. uh, they clamp down on on funerals. 
I'm assuming that's what happened in Colorado Springs. Yeah, Colorado, um, we had really strict restrictions, which was good. We didn't have, you know, we were on the lower end for deaths, but yeah, for funerals, nothing. And then we were allowed 10 people outdoors, five to 10 people outdoors for burials. Um, but, you know, a lot of people wanted to see their person. And that was the part that was hard. You know, I over and over again, it was like, well, I had it. Mom was in the nursing home and it was locked down. And I couldn't see her. And then she was taken to the hospital and she died alone. And you're telling me I still can't see her. And that was the hardest part is over and over again saying, I'm sorry. Like, we just we're not allowed to let people into the building. We're not. And I think. Looking back at it now, I can understand why we did that. It's not that the dead person wasn't safe. It was the living people who had been exposed to COVID, possibly. And so that's why they weren't really allowing the funerals. Um, but I still think I still think funeral homes probably could have done a lot better. We just didn't know how to do it better because we weren't in that situation before. But if I could go back, I would definitely have somehow given families more involvement, whether if that meant me, you know, doing a Zoom call and they could see their mom or tell me what clothes to put on her or anything like that, I think would have made um, a really big difference. But again, I just, I really want families to know like it's not too late. You can still have that funeral. You can still celebrate their life. And those are so important to have. They're so important. There are a myriad of questions. So I'm going to be jumping around a bit uh, <laughs> because there are bits of, of so much that you've said that I, I find so interesting and, and things that just come to mind. What kind of training do you did you receive to work in a corporate funeral parlor? I know you're doing training for others now. Mm -hmm. What, what, what kind of training do you go to school to get that so, kind of work? Yeah. Each state actually has different regulations of what you need to do to be a funeral director. Um, and Colorado is one of the states that you don't have to go to a mortuary college. Um, I had an associate's degree and then I worked 200 or 350 plus hours in a funeral home. So then I was a funeral director. Other states, you have a four-year degree. Um, some have a two-year program. Some have a one-year program. There's some states where you have to be an embalmer, whether you want to do it or not, before you can be a funeral director. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit different. But I, I got, I would say my core education did come from that corporate um training, which a lot of it for me, at least was very business focused and less people and grief focused. And so I got a lot of that education on my own. And, um, I studied sociology and got my bachelor's degree in that. And that really gave me the humanness that I was lacking. I felt like in my training as a funeral director, I know that sounds strange and I know that's not true for all funeral directors. There's some great funeral um, and mortuary colleges out there, but yeah, it's, it's not quite what I think people perceive, um, our training would be like. Is embalming the chief skill that you have to learn to become a funeral director? What are the other ones? Well, I don't even want embalming to be one of them. I think, so here's a really fun fact I told you about you know, that you can have home funerals. Most right. people don't, people don't understand that embalming is never required. It's not required by law. You can always say, no, I don't want them to be embalmed. Um, it's a very invasive procedure. I've watched it many, many times. And when I worked in the more corporate world and they did a lot of embalmings, I had a lot of families say that doesn't look like my person, <laughs> they look kind of strange. They look waxy or they have too much cosmetics. This last funeral home I worked at was completely natural. It was a green funeral home, meaning we did no embalming. Um, and I never once had a family make a complaint, not once. And I want to advocate for that to tell families too, that they have a choice not to do embalming. 
that they can keep their person intact and they still look just as good as they did, you know, when they were alive, other than the fact that they're dead now. Why is it done? Um, so embalming was actually first used during the Civil War when soldiers from the North were dying in the South and the families wanted their bodies sent um, back North for funerals and burials. But back then there was no refrigeration and the bodies were being sent by train. And by the time they got there, they were badly decomposed. So it was actually um, President Abraham Lincoln who brought this gentleman over and they started doing these crude embalmings on the battlefields so that soldiers could go home. Um, now fast forward to now and we have refrigeration, we have different tools for preservation. So embalming isn't really necessary in my opinion, other than the fact that it can do some restoration. Meaning if somebody was in an accident or had something, um, you know, really damaging happening to their body or their face. An embalmer can fix that. They can do restoration. They have tools where they can, they can build a, an ear, they can build a nose, they can make somebody look like the person. And I think viewings and spending time with a body after death are so important. And so I think embalmers do have an art for that work. But in general, for everyday, you know, families, um, a lot of funeral homes say that it's for safety. Like it's, you can't be around a dead body and that can't be further from the truth. The CDC even has a thing saying an unembalmed body or an embalmed body are just as safe to be around. It's, it's not one or the other. And in fact, embalming is really not safe for the embalmers, for the funeral homes, because they're using what's formaldehyde, which causes cancer. And you're taking all the blood out of the body and now putting this chemical inside. And so when I think about it that way, to keep somebody completely intact, not to take out their blood, not to put any chemicals inside, seems a lot more hygienic and safe to be around than somebody who has had an embalming procedure done. But there's a lot of funeral homes that still stand by the fact that somebody has to be embalmed to do a public visitation. And that's a, a place that I'm very passionate about. And um, the battle is really here in America, America, Canada, Puerto Rico, Mexico, the Philippines, and New Zealand are really the only countries that do embalming. Embalming is against the law in certain countries. They don't practice embalming at all. Um, so yeah, em embalming is something I'm very passionate about because I really feel strongly that most of the time it's not necessary. And if anything, I've seen it cause trauma for families when they, when they are trying to look at their person and they're like, that's not them. What did you do to them? Versus when I do nothing except or do some light cosmetics, you know, maybe brush their hair and they go, that's them. That's my person. I'm still trying to get my head around what else you have to learn to become a funeral director. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it really just depends on the state. Sometimes you don't have to learn. Well, I mean, I guess you should, I should say you learn the history, right? You're going to learn how to care for the body. And that's typically embalming. I would love to see more and more Trey colleges teach the more, um, you know, natural and organic ways to care for the dead. And then planning funerals, of course, like what makes a funeral service and all the steps that you need to take. And then the different um, goods that you can sell and how to sell them. Um, and some, some mortuary colleges are doing more kind of grief um, focused work too. And I do know of a mortuary college that also helps funeral directors be celebrants so that they can actually do the funeral and preside over it as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the gist of it. Thanks for listening to all of the above. Let me know what you think wherever you're listening and do me a favor, share it with a friend. You can follow my work at jamesbrowntv.substack.com. 
Paid subscribers get access to bonuses, including Tend the Hard Way, our members-only show. You can reach me at james at rochesteraccent.com or jamesbrowntv at gmail.com. You can also leave me a message at 585-484-0339. We might have you on the show. I'm James Brown, and as always, be well.